Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, being with us today. I also want to thank Nancy for creating the space for us to have this conversation. Uh, as you may know, some of you may have attended another Books That Shaped America uh, session uh, in the past. We had one last year that also focused on children's literature. And for those of you who don't know, the Books That Shaped America initiative comes to us from uh, the Library of Congress, where librarian uh, James Billingham has given us the opportunity to uh, consider what are the top 100 or so most influential books in American history. And this is one of them, and this is one of the few that's a children's literature selection. Yeah. There aren't very many. I want to say there might be about a handful, maybe five or so, yeah, if, if even. Um, there's a full listing on, on the website, and I'm happy to show that at the end as well. Um, so the book that we're going to focus on today is The Snowy Day. So we have two copies of it. One I'm going to pass around, and one that I'm going to lead uh, our discussion with first. Um, since this is a picture book, we can take the time to um, indulge and read and go through a little bit, but I also hope to be supported by my friend LeVar Burton, who is going to be narrating the book and as I turn the pages. If that doesn't work, then I will read the best that I can and turn the pages at the same time. So let's see how this goes. So I um, I'm very appreciative to the National Public Radio for having LeVar Burton actually online reading. No, I'll talk about it later. Oh, that's not working. Oh, you can't hear it at all. He walked with his toes pointing in, like that. Then he dragged his feet slowly. We will stop this and start again. And he found something sticking out of them. Your question about the barber for quite a few years. No, but he also served on the National Commission on Libraries and Information Sciences. No. And for some of you who know, he's uh, been one of the sponsors of Reading Rainbow, which was on PBS. Uh, Reading Rainbow is no longer sponsored by PBS. LeVar Burton has brought it back to um, being known. Uh, there are some controversies there, but we won't get into those so much. So. Let's hope the technology doesn't get in the way one more time, and we'll try again. Huh. Well, you get to hear my voice instead. <laughs> So after breakfast, he put on his snow suit and ran outside. The snow was piled up very high along the street to make a path for walking. This is our character Peter right here. Crunch, crunch, crunch. His feet sank into the snow. He walked with his toes pointing out like this. He walked with his toes pointing out like that. And you can see in the illustration that the, um, in the snow, his feet are going both ways. Then he engaged his feet slowly to make tracks, and he found something sticking out of the snow that made a new track. And there's a new track along here at the bottom. It was a stick, a stick that was just right for the smacking snow-covered tree. Here you can see Peter with his stick, and he's going to hit the tree and knock the snow down. 
down fell the snow, plop, on top of Peter's head. And then Peter walks off, snow covered. He thought it would be fun to join the big boys in their snowball fight, but he knew that he wasn't old enough, not yet. So there are some other boys playing with snowballs, and Peter's young, a little guy. So he made a smiling snowman, and he made angels. He pretended he was a mountain climber. He climbed up a great, tall, big, tall, heaping mountain of snow and slid all the way down. He picked up a handful of snow and another, and still another. He packed it round and firm and put the snowball in his pocket for tomorrow. Then he went into his warm house. He told his mother all about his adventures while he took off all of his wet socks. And he thought, and he thought, and thought, and thought. And you can see he's having a bath with a rubber ducky. Before he got into bed, he looked in his pocket. His pocket was empty. The snowball wasn't there. He felt very sad. So obviously he enjoyed his time in the snow and hoped that the snowball would still be there. While he slept, he dreamed that the sun had melted all the snow away. But when he woke up, his dream was, his dream was gone. The snow was still everywhere. New snow was falling. After breakfast, he called to his friend from across the hall, and they went out together into the deep, deep snow. Here we can see all the snowflakes and how big the snow is compared to two little boys. And all we have left is snow. And that's it. So the book itself is a very simple story. Um, but I want to provide us context of the story. I also want to talk about some of the complications of um, society and race. And I think that's a really important thing to do. I'm going to ask, though, that we try to hold questions um, toward the end, because I do want to get all the, the good details out of the way so that we can have a more informed conversation um, toward the end. Feel free to pass this around. Struggle with it, as I have struggled. <laughs> So Ezra Jack Keats is our author. Uh, he made his life as uh, a commercial illustrator. He was very lucky to become a children's author and then an illustrator, an artist of children's books. Uh, in all, he published and illustrated, wrote and illustrated about 30 books of his own and then also contributed illustrations to um, about 70 other books. Uh, here he is uh, in about 1980, and if you can see off to the side, this is his cat, Samantha. He was also a lover of animals. So some more information about Keats. He was born in Brooklyn in 1916. Uh, his parents were uh, immigrants. They were Polish Jews. He had to change his name. He felt that that was important to do um, to protect himself from anti-Semitism after um, and during the war. In World War II, he did work, um, and he was a member of the US Air Force. But he stayed uh, stateside and worked on designing camouflage patterns. So that's interesting, too. And before that, he was able to take a position that was funded from the New Deal and the WPA um, as uh, an illustrator and painter. His commercial work uh, appeared in some very major publications, so he, he was able to make a living this way, which was something that he and his family was very concerned about uh, his trajectory. And um, he also studied uh, art in his spare time, and from the uh, connections that he was able to make, he was uh, granted exhibitions in New York City at the Associated American Artist Gallery, which is a fairly big feat. What's the one thing that you may know about Ezra Jack Keats that might be surprising? 
and it has to do with his race. Anyone. All right. Uh, so as a Polish Jew, we can make the assumption that he was white, right? But many people who don't know his biography have made the assumption that he's black. And this book that we're celebrating today is being celebrated for depicting in full color one of the first main black characters in a children's book. Granted, there have been other black children um, depicted in children's literature and other literature. And we can think of previous examples, maybe one main one uh, from 1899, um, Little Black Sambo, right? So Little Black Sambo is a problematic illustration and character that's being presented um, in that story. In this story, we see a very simple plot line. We see a boy being a boy, regardless of race, but we're also acknowledging his race because he is a black young boy. And that is not something that major publishers had allowed or even thought that there was a market for. So this is a critical issue for us to consider, even today, and we're gonna talk about numbers uh, in a little bit. But I wanna say that uh, as we Consider why this book and why Ezra Jack Keats is so important. It's because his publishing company, Viking, which became Macmillan, provided a marketplace for his character. And again, he was privileged as a white man to be able to do that. And while that's what happened, we also have to acknowledge that it wasn't an African American who was given that right to enter the marketplace that way. So some timeline information that I want you to have as we consider um, Keats and his work is that this was his first book that he wrote and illustrated by himself. So again, while I mentioned he had illustrated other books, his first book wins the Caldecott Award. And for those of you who don't know, the Caldecott Award is one of the major awards um, presented by the American Library Association um, from the Association for Library Service to Children. It was started in 1938, and it's given to the, uh, an artist uh, who's the, created the most distinguished um, picture book <coughs> for children, and it's particular to American publishing. So Keith wins this award in 1963, and then goes on to have a fairly successful career being published. Um, in 1983, when he passes, he's left us a tremendous um, overall of his work, not just children's literature, but also illustrations that again have been published in other uh, formats. He um, also establishes uh, a foundation for himself before he dies and actually quite soon after he um, wins the Caldecott and that happens in the 60s. And then the foundation itself creates an archive that's based uh, at the University of Southern Mississippi, um, the DeGrumman Children's Collection, which is one of the foremost children's collections of uh, historical children's material in our country. The other one being at my alma mater, University of Florida. Um, and as an undergraduate, I was really lucky to have the chance to be able to do research and see that collection. So as a librarian, one of the important things that I bring to this conversation is the importance of collecting children's literature as a reflection of history and the ways that we can unpack history and make sure um, that we're teaching our children about not just you know, the values that we want them to um, have in their lives, but also to understand the greater good and what's going on in society. Historically though, now we can look at children's literature and unpack it in a, in a way so that we can critique our history and we can also make sure that we create spaces and other collections that are more representative. It's an important thing to note that um, this book had its 50th anniversary in 2012 uh, and at that time it was celebrated um, quite widely and we're going to take a look uh, at uh, 
uh, a clip, hopefully, if we can get the sound to work, uh, from the Jewish Museum, um, where they've created uh, an exhibition that also traveled across the United States. And then, lastly, something to note is his birthday was March 11th. So he would have just been 100 years old. So this is a, a really appropriate time uh, in our history to acknowledge his contributions to, to our society. Uh, a couple things also to note about Keats is he never married. Uh, he had two uh, best friends from childhood. They grew up together blocks away in Brooklyn, uh, in, in a part of Brooklyn that was called East New York, uh, which I'm not familiar with, but uh, I haven't looked it up. So uh, the other thing to note is that his best friend becomes the chairman and president of his foundation, along with um, his best friend's wife. And currently today, their daughter is the current president of that foundation. Uh, as we look a little bit more at the book, uh, I want us to consider the character of Peter himself. So here's a quotation from Keats um, that is on the Foundation's website. And it tells us a little bit more about why he chose to create the character of Peter. Um, off on the um, left-hand side of the screen, you can see this vertical uh, pictorial representation of a young black child. And this child was published in Life Magazine in 1940. And it's a publication of a child who's just about to have an inoculation or a blood test. There's uh, some evidence that says both, but we're not really sure. Um, it's hard to tell from the slide, but at first, um, the documentation of the child is, is happy and carefree. They're about to tell the, the kid what's exactly going to happen to him. And he's like, oh no, is it going to hurt? And then after he has the test or the inoculation, he's feeling kind of ouchy. So his face is a little like, and he's not feeling good. Um, but that me, just, just, this, uh, uh, just these pictures made such an impression on Keats. He clipped it out and um, kept it uh, at his work, work area, um, sort of as his, um, you know, as his muse in a sense, as his way to think through that this, this little kid who he never knew made such an impression on him. So this quote, um, without reading it verbatim, um, tells you a little bit more about that story. Um, but he knew just from having that, this picture that he wanted this child to be the hero of his book. And that's how we get the character of Peter. So we see Peter's appearance change a little bit over time. There are uh, a total of six books that he publishes with Peter in them. Um, and we see Peter um, get almost to uh, adolescence, pre-adolescence. And his last uh, appearance in a publication is in the 1972 book, Pet Show, exclamation point. So as we take a look at the work that uh, Keats has given us, we see that he's used several different techniques as well. Um, and this is also important to acknowledge as an illustrator, um, using collage was really unique at this time in children's literature. And now we see that represented so much. Gouache. Gouache is an art technique that has to, uh, uses watercolors and sort of like a, a gum or a paste-like wash to give it um, sort of a sh like a sheen or a shine. And when we're looking at the snow, we're able to see the snow twinkle a little bit um, because of the gouache technique. And we can see the watercolor, the paint itself, kind of distribute and give us a little bit more of a landscape. And it gives us a more of a 3D effect. Um, and this is definitely an important part because we're seeing him not only as the author, but the illustrator of this book too. So the impact there um, is worth noting for a couple of reasons. One, it's actually very rare in children's literature for uh, an author of a book to be able to choose who's going to illustrate. So if you have those skills to illustrate at the same time, then that's, that's wonderful because you have full control, full ownership of the story that's being told. Um, the other thing that we're seeing too is that um, he didn't have to, as the illustrator, he didn't have to have that argument with his publishing company about the race of Peter. 
and about not just Peter, but other characters that he also incorporates. Um, the very first book that he authored, but didn't, um, uh, and this predates uh, The Snowy Day, but he was sort of like a joint author, but um, illustrated, but didn't have full control. The main character's name was Juanito. And he was a character, again, a, a young boy of color, um, who, um, while he didn't have full control of the storyline itself, he was still able to contribute to the illustrations. But now, he's been able to do that. And Viking and his editor has allowed him the political capital to sell this, this exact title. So we see the development there of how, how this book came to be and how all of a sudden a market is created. So the market itself is important and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Now, I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to watch um, these uh, two clips. Um, we will see what actually happens with our volume, but um, I think, this first one um, is a clip from a DVD that's about Keats. So let's see if we can make this work. paint, the dark alleys, the back alleys. He makes it beautiful. He was the first to create a whole body of work around that and to have characters who live and breathe through groups of books that kids could attach to and identify. <laughs> express through Peter his own humanity about children and people of all colors, of all races. Escher was probably one of the kindest people that I've come across. He was very sensitive, he was very caring, and he was 600% modest. The thing that strikes me immediately is the boldness uh, of his compositions and the boldness almost to the point of aggressive use of color. And that's a great compliment because I think anyone who can pull that off can pretty well do anything else they want to do. His books are about a child who's universal. He's every child. And every child can relate to him at each stage in his life. As Peter, who puts the snowball in his pocket and is surprised when the snow melts. As Peter, who's jealous when he's getting a baby sister. As Peter, when he first meets Amy. As Whistle for Willie, as when he learns to whistle. All of these things are universal. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're city, country, or what. They're universal. In addition, his art is remarkable. It's outstanding. And the combination is unforgettable. He found in the first picture book that he could develop himself, which was Snowy Day. He could think like a child. He could paint like a fine artist. And he could add to it his social conscience. He could add to it that spark that made these books necessary. Earlier books tended to be in rural settings, with trees and grass. Ezra was in the streets of New York. There was graffiti. There were buildings. Ezra took that 
and he created this wonderful world of urban life and a rich palette that suggested sunlight and of course the snowy day and the snow and that was a really kind of a fresh voice. <coughs> Humanity with all its failings and it's all its greatness and all its weaknesses. That's what he uh, wanted to portray. And that's what showed in his work. That's the sense in which he felt that in his own world, the world that he created, he could correct the inequities of life on the outside. His work has undoubtedly opened the eyes and minds of an awful lot of children to the way we should be. He once said that he spent a lot of his life not knowing if he had anything to say that anyone would want to know. And I think in Snowy Day, what he realized is, yes, he really did have something to say. He had something very important to say to children. And that gave him the creative spark that lasted him the rest of his life. So that comes to us directly from the foundation itself, and that was created in 2006. The second video that I want to show us that gives us a little bit more background on um, Keats is um, the video that I mentioned before from the Jewish mu Museum from his, uh, the 50th, roughly around the 50th anniversary. So this exhibition video was created in 2011. born Jacob Ezra Katz to Polish Jewish immigrant parents. He was born in 1916 and grew up in the East New York section of Brooklyn. Later in life, Keats would look towards these memories of his childhood and use them for inspiration in his, uh, in his stories. So the art in this gallery is very autobiographical and uh, although it comes later in his career, we show it first to help us understand Keats' own story. In the mid-1970s, Keats created the character of Louis, which very much serves as a self-portrait of the artist. Louis is very shy, very quiet, very introverted. He gets kind of teased and bullied by his first classmates, but he's also very artistic and creative, just like Keats. And so Louis, when he encounters a difficult situation or to overcome his obstacles, he uses his art and imagination just as Keats would as a child. Keats is probably most well-known for his glass techniques, but he was first and foremost a painter. Keats painted this painting, Shantytown, when he was just 17 years old, and it won first prize at a national scholastic competition. After World War II, Jack Katz would change his name to Ezra Jack Keats, probably in response to pervasive anti-Semitism. At the time, Keats was working as an illustrator, first in the comic industry, and then eventually moving into magazines, and from there, dust jackets and prison strips. And you'll notice in all the children's books he was illustrating, not one of them had a minority character. Black folk is almost completely invisible in children's literature. So Ezra Jack Keats decided to do something about it. Published in 1962, The Snowy Day was the first book that Keats solely authored and illustrated. In 1963, it won the Caldecott Medal for being the premier book of the year, so not bad for being Keats' first book. Although the plot is autobiographical, the character itself, Peter, was inspired by this little boy here. And as Keats would say later, he made Peter an African-American because really he should have been there all along. This was the first time Keats experimented with collage. He never really used collage before, as we just mentioned. He was first and foremost a painter. We also see, though, here, he created a really luminous quality to the artwork. Uh, he took a pink piece of paper to create the snow and actually painted the white over it rather than using a white piece of paper. And as a result, you can kind of see the the pinks and the oranges kind of coming through under the snow, uh, under the white paint, and it really lends this kind of shimmering quality to the snow. Very, uh, very creative approach to doing snow on paper. Not only does Peter grow up, but all his friends do too. 
Peter's little sister Susie, her friend Roberto, they all comprise Peter's neighborhood. As we are in Peter's neighborhood in this gallery, we have also reconstructed Peter's neighborhood, so to speak. Uh, we've created this wonderful reading room for children where they can enjoy not only Keith's books, but books that carry about Keith's legacy of racial and ethnic diversity. We are now in one of the final sections of the exhibition in which we explore Keats's spirituality and his interest in nature and Asian art. This is a really excellent example of Keats's masterful use of marble paper, which was an ancient Chinese practice. Keats's books have touched a lot of people's lives, but they also helped transform Keats himself. Through his art and his characters and his books, Keats was able to come to terms with his own upbringing and his childhood, as well as bring us these wonderful universal stories that everybody can relate to. That just about wraps up our online tour, but we were only able to show you a snippet of the exhibition here. So I guess we're going to have to come back and see the exhibition in person. The Snowy Day in the Art of Mr. Jack Keats is on view here at the Beers Museum in New York until January 29th. After that, we'll be touring to three additional venues across the United States. For more information on the Jewish Museum, our exhibitions, and our programs, visit www.thejewishmuseum.org. Thanks so much for stopping by. So uh, as you can see, the exhibition traveled and then actually ended up closing um, in uh, 2013 and 2014. It moved on after that, after 2013. Uh, so sadly, we can't visit the Jewish Museum. But this uh, video is our um, evidence that the exhibit occurred. And we, fortunately, the Jewish Museum has maintained um, the video plus some other uh, illustrations that have been digitized from Keats uh, from their exhibition. <coughs> So getting back to what we were talking about, um, we're talking also about marketplace. And so if we come to today, this, these figures that I'm presenting to you uh, come uh, to us uh, from um, the University of Wisconsin and the Cooperative Center um, for, I'm always gonna get this wrong, for uh, children's and books, children's books, um, is a place where all the books that are, mostly all the books that are being published for children, and picture books specifically, um, are being sent to this place at the University of uh, Wisconsin. So in 2015, about 3,200 books are being received um, by the center. And of those, um, you can see the figures, the by and about African Americans, by and about uh, American Indians and First Nations people, uh, Latinos and Asians. Uh, and again, this is specific to U.S. publications only. If we're brought to broaden this number out a little bit more, it doesn't get bigger. It doesn't get that much bigger. The majority of these books are being published in the United States. Um, and if it does get bigger, it gets bigger by like 200 or so. Uh, and so that's our international marketplace for children's books at this point. The, um, so what does this mean for us? How do we figure this out uh, historically and give it some context? So if about 3,200 books were published now, we can look back um, to about 1980, and it's about 2,500 at that point. We look back even further, and the numbers dwindle. But you know, it's usually, usually around 1,000 or so going back even further to the 60s. Now before that, what happens? Well, obviously, th these numbers don't exist as we go back, but um, the children's book marketplace is a business. And so it took until 1962 for this marketplace to be able to create a space, to get a place for a, a book to be published with a black character. And who bought the books? Well, society did. People, who, African Americans, white people, everyone, everyone in, bought this book in particular. And that's what made this market take off a little bit, but it's not where it could be. If we look at these figures today, we should argue that um, that's, these numbers are paltry, it, or paltry in comparison to the total that are being published. Now let's keep this other thing in mind. If we've got about 3,200 books, and of them, maybe 302 are by or about African Americans, and we look at the other figures for other minorities, we still see that the number of books is still in the thousands. Um, so what are those books about? Are they about white kids? Yeah, 
Are they about animals? Yes. Are they about nonfiction and other, other common trade materials that might not have, uh, might have to do about science and might not incorporate a human perspective? Yes. So we do have to keep that in mind. But we still need to keep in mind the fact that our, this marketplace could be doing a heck of a lot better than what it's doing um, with these last figures that we have for last year. Nancy, sure. Yeah. My understanding is that there's a divide, there's a split. There's a split. So it's the 102 is by and the 240. And we're not necessarily about that. Right. Okay. There is definitely um, overlap. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't calculate that overlap. Because we see that writers of color are more likely to have more characters than characters. So we have this unequal representation. Now I offer you this other graph. Um, and this comes to us from um, School Library Journal. And this graph then shows us, at least for roughly the last decade, the buy and about figures um, per uh, minority. So we see here the dotted line, this is about African Americans, and we see the solid orange line here is by African Americans. So, you know, there, there is some difference in the last decade, but at least the about number is going up, and again, these numbers are going up a little bit. These are the by numbers. So what are some things that could be done? Schools of education, colleges can better support uh, these collections. They can also better support the funding and education of um, creative, uh, creative works and, and authors who are in MFA programs, right? Um, the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation has uh, money, a monetary award, to support young authors and young illustrators. PBS Kids is another uh, organization that supports the creative works of young authors and illustrators to get them uh, encouraged to write and to think about illustration as a potential career. And the marketplace is also hard, right? We know um, from bookstores closing, we know from um, our own e evidence here in, in our libraries that um, the physical print book is somewhat in danger. But for children's literature, it's still a very important part of a child's development. And then we have to ask ourselves questions of who has access to these books? Who's allowing that access to occur? So here we are at American University in a very lovely Tony part of Washington, DC. And we have a children's collection that can be used by our students, staff, and faculty, and used by anyone who wants to come into uh, our library. So I want to talk a little bit about our curriculum and how um, the evidence of the marketplace then matches to libraries, to our experience here, and to what we're teaching um, our students at American University. And some of you, uh, this is going to be repeat information because you might already know it. But um, Vivian Vasquez, who is my colleague in the School of Education, Vivian is professor of uh, education and early childhood education. And she is our rock star in the area of critical literacy. And she has uh, published prolifically. This is um, one of her textbooks that uh, is used to teach children, or I'm sorry, to teach teachers about how to teach children to question what they see, um, not only represented in children's books, but also in society at large. And this text and the critical literacy curriculum asks students to work with children's literature, ask teachers to work with children's literature, and then have students question what they're seeing. So that question, that inquiry, is who's represented in the book? What are the main characters doing? How does this relate to history and society today? What do we see as evidence of um, the main characters or um, the side characters? Who are they? Who do they represent? If you're teaching a child, uh, or you're teaching a, a Title I school full of um, students who are minorities, are you going to bring in books that only teach about uh, or only show or depict 
white children in them? No, that shouldn't be the case. We don't have, I still say we don't have enough books that depict children of color, but we can do better. And so the efforts that we're um, incorporating one is teaching this methodology, having this pedagogy here at AU. And we're not the only ones. This is very common across most schools of education, but we're very lucky to have Vivian here as our expert. And she is also my partner in helping to create our children's literature collection and has been uh, now since, I've, uh, since 2004, since I started in this position. Um, so I buy books. I buy books that are, um, are award winners, like the Caldecott Award. I buy books that um, publishers try to sell to me. But I also try to buy books that are recognized by societies, um, whether it's the American Library Association or the National Councils of, of Teachers of English, um, to buy books that are going to help other children see themselves in them. And um, we're very lucky here at AU to um, have some sustaining funding to do that. And I want to talk about that in just a little bit. But the first thing I want to talk about is um, this example that's just occurred in our, our, our world, our, our society, this just this um, winter. So the 1,000 Black Girl Books hashtag. Uh, this is a movement that started on Twitter. Um, and it started um, um, by Marley uh, Diaz. And she is, who's depicted here, um, splayed out across a number of books that depict uh, female characters of color. Uh, she has been very widely covered in the news because she has created this movement to make people and also make the general public aware that this is a problem. This marketplace issue that we're talking about is a problem. Libraries need to take part in buying books that show uh, children of color in them. Uh, in, in part, what she's, do she's done is she's created a service project to identify at least 1,000 books, and she's gone over at this point, to um, then have delivered to a library in need in Jamaica. But by doing this, she's brought this issue to fore. And I am one of many librarians out there who is trying to take advantage of the work that she has done, the organization that she's working with, and her parents and teachers um, to be able to then take these identified texts and make sure that we have them here in our library. So I want to call out my student assistant, Jess Wojcik, who's here. Um, Jess is a former student of mine and also my current student in the Curriculum Materials Center. But one of Jess's current projects now is to um, go through a database that they have just created. Actually, they just made public this last week. So in, in fact, what Jess has been doing up until this week is going through the tweets on Twitter to identify the books that have been the <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, good. I hope you, I, your eyes are better than mine. But, but the good news is we do have a number of them. So at this point, we've identified um, roughly about 100 books that we can purchase right now um, to get started on this project. And as we go into our next fiscal year, which begins in May, we can continue the purchasing as well. And I also want to thank Nancy Davenport for um, encouraging this project as well and, and blessing it. So I feel as if, I believe, I believe strongly that um, the work that Marley is doing is, is really tied to um, the work that Vivian has put forward and other scholars of children's literature and critical literacy practice has put together. And this is the core example. We want to see our young kids as activists to be involved in changing society. So critical literacy practice actually can't fully happen until a student takes initiative and puts together a project like this one. And frankly, we're really lucky that we, not just the library in Jamaica gets to benefit, but other libraries out there that have funding can um, take part. And not only libraries, but we talk about teachers and, and classroom libraries as well. And also um, young kids of color who will see themselves in books and with the hope that um, their parents, their families, other reading foundations and associations are going to be able to tap into a database like this one and be able to make sure that the books um, that are not as widely known as, say, The Snowy Day, written by a white man, um, can be found and also uh, available and accessible to children of color. And it's even better if they are by uh, African Americans. So I thought maybe we take the time 
to just hear a little bit from Marley because I think this is a, a really nice um, story to hear from her. Support for NPR and the following message come from the new Chevrolet Volt. With regen on demand, location-based charging, and a backup gas generator, the new Chevrolet Volt is Thank you, Chevrolet. a car with a backup plan. <laughs> Chevrolet, find new roads. Marley Diaz is 11 years old. She loves reading, but she noticed that a lot of the books at school were about white boys or dogs, or like the award-winning children's novel Shiloh, they were about white boys and their dogs. We asked Marley to elaborate on what bothered her. Basically, it was the lack of diversity in my fifth grade class. We were only reading books such as Where the Red Fern Grows, Class, The Shiloh series, and um, Old Yeller. So I noticed that, and I was frustrated because I was never reading books about black girls or any different type of characters. So I went home and I told my mom, and she said, well, what are you going to do about it? So I decided to start a campaign in which black girls were the main characters and then give uh, those books to various schools. Wow. You're 11 years old, and you've decided this is a problem, and I'm going to take it on myself. Yes, yes, I did. And, and just tell me why it was important to you and why you think it's important for 11-year-olds <laughs> you know, to be reading books that have more diversity. Well, I think it's important in general for kids to be reading books with diversity. When you read about a character that you can connect with, you'll remember the things that they learned. So if I liked Terrible's, and the character I'm reading about likes hair bows, I'll remember what he or she learned in that book because I have something in common with them. And, and so it was not a matter of you wanting books to be about black girls. You just wanted the characters to be people who you could relate to more. Yeah, I just I think that it was definitely about access. At home, I could read those books, and I could read as many as I wanted, but when I came to school, it wasn't really available for me to read. Okay, so you take it upon yourself, and you start collecting books that have more diverse characters in them. Where were you getting these books? Were you buying them, or what was happening? No, we weren't buying them. We were getting just donations from people who saw the campaign on social media. And I think that it's a lot better when they give books, because then they know where their money's going. We did get some money donations, which was definitely helpful for us when we travel and we had to hire people to help log books, because there's so many. Were you sort of the boss? Were you kind of giving them instructions on um, how you wanted this to be done? Yes, I am. But because I have school, I can't spend, like, the day helping opening books all the time. But I try my best because I don't want to just be the boss and be the representative. I want to be a part of every aspect of the work that I've created. I just don't want to be, like, the big boss who doesn't do much. I love that. <laughs> that seems like a very good lesson to learn in, in life very early on. What, what's been um, the most memorable moment so far since you started doing this? Oh, that's a tough one. Well, of course... When we reached 1,000 books, which was so big of a deal, it was really awesome. And then when I went on the Ellen Show, I've never been on TV or done anything like that made me famous or anything in any respect. So it's just all of it really is super important and super special. So the bottom line, you were trying to collect 1,000 books and give them away, and you kind of blew right through your goal and have collected a lot more which is awesome. Do, do you have a new goal now? We don't have a new goal, but I do have a bigger idea now that we reach the goal. Uh, it's that we have school boards assigning books where it's very diverse, and it's not just one type that they're trying to focus on. There's all different characters, all different races, all different genders. So that's definitely one of the big things that I want to achieve because I know that I'm definitely not the only kid or student out there who's experiencing this problem. Uh, Marley, you've probably heard this before. You're a very impressive young woman. Thank you. Best of luck to you, and, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us about this. No problem. Nope. So uh, just some last connections to uh, our work here at American University. Uh, this is uh, our, our dear uh, lost um, alumna, Larissa Gerstel. Our children's literature collection is named after Larissa, and it's because of uh, the work that she was inspired to do under uh, the instruction of, of Vivian Vasquez uh, in particular, and also because of the work that her family uh, wanted to do to connect her memory and her work to the work that I'm doing here and many of us are doing in uh, literacy and teaching, that we have the Lisa Gristle Critical Literacy Collection, which is an endowed collection thanks to the Sites family, her family. 
Um, we um, are inspired by her verve to continue to collect in the vein of uh, Marley Diaz to be able to show uh, multicultural representations. But again, it expands beyond race to religion and gender and sexuality and um, any other kind of ability or other kind of um, access issue that children face and, and being able to figure out the world that, that we've constructed for them and hope that they're also going to then further and help solve the issues that we face today. So the space upstairs is on our third floor. For those of you who haven't been there, uh, I invite you to explore. Uh, it is open to the public and um, I'm very grateful for the work that I've been able to do um, in concert with my library administration and the Sites family. Um, so we will use um, the some of the endowment money to buy the books that, that Marley has uh, identified. And that, um, again, is something that I think is really important. I'm so glad to have um, Jess with me to be able to, to get that work completed. So on a final note, I think we should try to live by the words of, of Keats and see um, what everyone brings to, to our world and contributes. Thanks so much for coming. I'd like to open up to any questions that you all have. Thank you. Nancy. I think that's a really, that's a good question. I think it was because it was the first that was the most impactful. It's, if we think of, of a gateway, it's the one that opened up um, the possibility. So we can say um, with some certainty, and again, it might have to do with, again, the marketplace, the editors that Keats was working with who made it possible that it opened up the marketplace, not just to other white authors who wanted to incorporate black characters, but also I would hope black authors who were showing their experience. The criticism of this book though in the 60s was that it did not go far enough. The story is so simple, yet there's no critical discussion of race, of um, uh, inequality. So it's just a little boy. It's just a little boy. And so we have, we have to consider that too and, and consider the time, obviously, the conversations where the civil rights movement was, was underway and Keats was well aware of inequalities in, in his place in Brooklyn. Yes, sir. Is uh, 11 years for the Calvert uh, an ordinary span of time or an extraordinary long span of time? When you say 11? Well, it was published in 62. 62. 62. It's one year. It's one year. Yeah. No, 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 that's okay. That's a good question. It's usually, it's usually quick right after the publication. Yeah. But isn't that one of the definitions? Yes, the in the last year. Mm -hmm. Chris. Is there any responsibility for Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and major, major leaders of the civil rights movement um, were concerned that the book did not go far enough. Were, were spaces, obviously spaces weren't. Well, I think this is, this, is, this is debatable. My take on this is um, there's white guilt at play and that um, a lot of the publishing industry at the time was run obviously by um, powerful, rich um, people who, um, who were white. And so they saw this as um, a start, something that they helped create. And that's also, you know, you've got to think is that, is that that's, is, thank goodness they did, but at the same time, it's also problematic because it's not their lived experience. Even up here, I am a white man talking about um, the potential of, of lived experience of a person of color, and I, don't, I just don't, I don't have that experience. So that's, that's, that's the huge criticism. Um, the other issue, too, as we look at children's books, especially published in the 70s, um, when we see um, you know, series like Fat Albert coming out, that we see um, characters who are illustrated and you 
can't really tell, you can't tell texture of hair, you can't tell facial features or expressions, and you can't maybe tell the differences between um, all the races um, and variations of, uh, of how people could be represented. So we've seen illustration kind of, um, you know, take that uh, sense of problem, you know, a, a certain problem, kind of like whitewashing a bit, and then coming up to today to try to be more realistic so that what's being, what's being published is truth, it is experience. And we have some examples of those books in our collection because it's important to, to work with those books with children so that they can see the difference between what, on a, what someone looks like authentically and also what someone else has created to make them look like even though we can only tell by the gradation of color. We might not be able to tell by language. We might not be able to tell by culture. We might not be able to tell um, in those ways. And that's, that's problematic. So at least we've seen that evolution happen to a point today where we you know, are being able to see um, culture and authenticity in the books and especially those books that are written by African Americans about African Americans and being marketed in the marketplace and bought by everybody, libraries included. Eighteen ninety nine. I, I, I thank you for offering that opinion. Good. Well, thank you all for coming. Please enjoy some refreshments. <laughs>